Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz at ClassicsToday.com here to talk to you about the Telarc Mahler cycle assembled from its various Mahler recordings by various people. I deliberately have not looked at what you get so that I can have a spontaneous reaction to the contents and share it with you all. So are you ready? Have a seat, relax, and let's get hopping. Symphony number no. one, Levy and the Atlanta Symphony. Really, they didn't have much choice because in Mahler one, they only have a kind of dullish Slatkin and this one. This is a very pretty performance. It really is. It's a beautiful performance. It's very well played. Just not one of the most exciting ones, especially in the finale. So, you know, it's good. No one's going to have a problem with it. It's just not first rate. It isn't. Sorry, not one of the top. Number two is also Levy and the Atlanta Symphony. Now here, Telarc actually had a choice because they have a really, really great Slatkin recording, which has disappeared, of course, completely um, off the face of the earth. That was a wonderful performance. It never got a lot of attention. It's very similar to Bruno Walters in that it's a sort of quickish, um, sort of organic, not, you know, let it all hang out crazy like Bernstein can get kind of performance, but it was super superbly recorded. I mean, my God, the finale was a knockout sonically and the playing was great and I would have liked to have heard Slack it. However, with that said, Levy's is superb. It's probably the one of the two, I would say, highlights, two or three highlights of his Mahler cycle. It's, it's absolutely brilliantly played, also extremely well recorded, fabulously sung by the chorus. What's not to love? Also, a somewhat cool performance. Levy was a, a sort of an intellectual kind of conductor. He wasn't one for the more romantic insanity that Mahler occasionally indulged in, but it, there's nothing to complain about. This is one of the great seconds, I think. It'll be on my Mahler 2 video at some point. Number three, Jesus Lopez Cobos with the Cincinnati Symphony. Another very good performance. Another performance that didn't get a lot of attention. It's a little bit maybe a little bit underplayed in a couple of spots. It, you know, it could have, the first movement, I think, could have a little bit more kind of uh, guts and, and, and you know, hair on its back, as it were. You know, it could be scruffier in its sound and the vulgar passages that are intentionally so. I mean, Lopez Cobos is kind of a refined conductor. And so maybe that bit of the third, you know, wasn't entirely suited to his way of thinking about the music, but everything else is very good. Again, the sound is very good. Um, it's a beautiful performance of the third. You're, you're not going to be disappointed. Number four is Levy in Atlanta again. First rate. One of the great fourths. I have no doubt about it. The only issue is that in the finale, Frederica von Stade is a little bit over the hill, shall we say. You know, but maybe that only makes her sound more boyish, a little huskiness in the voice. It's a great fourth. It, it's it's absolutely fabulously played and recorded, and you can't go wrong. Number five, Levy in Atlanta. Sorry, one of the weakest in that cycle. You know, the fifth, the fifth gets them. It just gets them every time. I really don't quite understand why. It's one of those pieces where if they would just do what's right in front of them. <laughs> it would all work out okay. This is a very cool, very unemotional, to my mind, very unaffecting version that, um, however well played, it, it just it just is lacking in color and passion and fire and, you know, eh. but that's okay because there's so many bad fifths out there. It's really kind of a shocker. All right, number six is Levy in Atlanta. That's also a great sixth. One of the commentators very kindly pointed out to me that it originally had an exposition repeat in the first movement, which was taken out so that it would fit on one disc. But as I said in the Mahler 6 summary, I don't care. It sounds great. It's fabulously played, fabulously recorded, and it has all of the passion and intensity, especially in the finale, that's, that's just lacking in the performance of the fifth. What is it about the fifth that just gets them every time. All right. Seventh is also Levy in Atlanta. Again, Telarc had no choice. I, 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 you know, eh, 
a performance of, you know, similar similar qualities in some ways to the sixth, and that it's very well played. But again, it's just lacking, like the fifth. It's it's lacking in 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 color, in creepiness, in an investigation of the music's dark underbelly and all of the shadows and half tints and things that Mahler does. This is a very straight, clean run through, but, uh, you know, and it doesn't have, you know, at the end, you want the clangor of cowbells and chimes. It's all got to go crazy. That's not Levy. And that's not this performance. Number eight. Well, of course, it's going to be Shaw in Atlanta. Oh, dear. Unfortunately, this is typical Shaw. In other words, very well sung, beautifully recorded, and boringly conducted. Not slow, not slowly conducted, but just just faceless. It's just faceless. And, you know, I mean, you, you, you want an eighth, it's got to sound like an epic event, right? You don't want one that sounds like, you know, choir festival getting together and doing Mahler eighth. It doesn't go over there for me. Number nine is Lopez Cobos in Cincinnati. Now, I think this is a very fine ninth. I really do. It, it's it's sensitive. It's beautiful. It's passionate. It's the kind of music that Lopez Cobos does well because it has great clarity in the contrapuntal sections. Again, the Rondo Burlesque. It, I mean, it could be have more ferocity. It could be meaner. Lopez Cobos is like a really nice guy, apparently. <laughs> but um, but the performance itself, the outer movements are are beautifully done. They really are. Um, and again, it's very well recorded. I, I think this is a fine ninth. I, I'm impressed by it still. And I, I was actually listening to it, not this one, because I didn't peak, but uh, a little while ago, just going through my Mahler ninths and spot checking things to see if I was going senile. Please don't respond to that. I don't want to know the truth, but um, it's held up. It, it's, it's very, very, very good. Um, you get the Adagio from the 10th with Levy in Atlanta, which is fine. But why? Oh, why? When they have a complete Mahler 10th in the revised Massetti version by Lopez Cobos, was that not included? I mean, come to think of it, why were the three Mahler song cycles, also with Lopez Cobos in Cincinnati, not included? You know, it, it amazes me. Usually when we have one of these boxes, you know, we talk about the major labels, it's the complete this or the complete that we are, and we fetch about what's in and what's out. And, you know, you expect a label like Telarc, which doesn't have a heck of a lot of choice in this repertoire, to, to just do it correctly. I mean, it's not Telarc, the label anymore, because they don't exist anymore, but whatever Telarc is being handled by, you know, get your Mahler and stick it in a box. What could be hard about that? I don't understand it. So what is this? This is sort of like, you know, a substantial box of mostly second tier Mahler, but with a few really first rate, first rate performances. Numbers two, three, four, six, and nine. So that's five out of nine. Not terrible but also not fabulous. If you have individual recordings of these things, I don't see any point in getting the box, although I think it's very, very inexpensive. I mean, I bought this, it was really cheap. I mean, so it's your call, folks. You know your Mahler, you know what to get. Again, just so we're clear, two, three, four, six, and nine. Those are your safe bets. The others you can do without. Oh, incidentally, you might be wondering what I have to say about the fact that none of Benjamin Zander's Mahler is in the box, because that was also on Telarc. Well, I think the fact that no Zander is in the box kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? But the bottom line is that nothing Zander did is better than anything that's in the box. So I don't worry about Zander, and neither should you. Thank you, and keep on listening. <laughs>